good morning or good evening. Uh, welcome to Scott or welcome back. Um, we are with you again with uh, uh, country case Brazil. Today, our speakers are going to tell us what has happened in uh, tourism industry over a decade in Brazil. And we are going to uh, have this information firsthand. Uh, without any ado, I would like to ask uh, the president of Scott, Professor Jafar Jafari, to enlighten us with uh, the opening remark. Professor Jafari, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Kazem. Uh, it's very nice to be with all of you. I have met almost all of you sometimes in the in the past in Brazil or somewhere else. Uh, it's good to be back together. As uh, Kazem mentioned, your topic is excellent because it has historical perspective and it's dealing with uh, with with a topic that was. Uh, uh, extremely visible uh, during the COVID-19 period. In other words, uh, um, we in the academic community uh, published many, many articles on the subject of uh, pandemic and, uh, and tourism. Uh, sometimes I recall I was counting the number of journals uh, uh, that had special issues on uh, COVID-19 and tourism, and that was about 20 of them books came out. And it was, uh, it's all expressed the pain uh, that the tourism industry went through for almost, for over two years. Uh, a very thriving uh, industry with the giant economic muscles, uh, the power of employment, and then suddenly there was a shutdown. Uh, gradually, but uh, practically everywhere, uh, it was a shutdown and tourism went on, on a sort of hibernation for uh, over two years. Um, I hope uh, we learned some lessons uh, from uh, 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 the two years, uh, the two years, painful two years uh, that the tourism industry went through. Uh, but I haven't done any survey of, of anything yet on, on the next point I'm going to make, but I'm afraid the, the tourism industry and the tourists themselves may not have learned any lessons because uh, the, the spot, the places I have visited uh, in Spain and elsewhere, it's, uh, things is back to the way it used to be. Both the tourists and the tourism industry are, are basically forgetting uh, what it was like. So I wonder to what extent you believe uh, the lessons have been learned by the tourism industry, not only in Brazil, but also in other countries of Americas as well as elsewhere. Um, one thing that I, I want to remind everybody, those who are returning to us uh, and those who are new for the first time on the Scott webinar series, um, our uh, focus uh, is uh, small communities, small developments, village tourism, small operators, middle-sized operators. Uh, so uh, perhaps the tourist, the big tourism industry has learned some lessons. But the question is that the question that Scott would like to ask: What did uh, we academicians do for the little communities, for the village tourism? They had they had no one to turn to. Uh, they were basically helpless. At least the big hotels in big cities, big airlines managed to do it in differently, but nobody went to the aid of the small destinations, villages that were depending on tourism, and suddenly they had nothing to deal with. So I hope uh, we can talk about that, and I hope we can talk about some of the lessons that uh, has been learned for small community tourism development. Uh, I would like the panel to uh, think that in the audience there are uh, some members of the small operators, village tourism community, small communities, and also so so that we can speak to the um, to the to, to their needs and suggest ways forward. Uh, it's a very exciting topic. Uh, unfortunately. 
Uh, I don't speak Portuguese, but fortunately we have translation into uh, into English. So we, I will be with, uh, with you and with the with the panel all the time to the end. And once more, welcome to uh, welcome to the webinar series, both the speakers uh, as well as the member <coughs> uh, of audience. Um, Kazem, that's all for my uh, brief welcome remarks, uh, and uh, the game can begin. Thank you very much, Jafar. Uh, as always, very complete and very concise. Um, um, as uh, Jafar mentioned, uh, we have two languages. Please select the channel that you want to listen to in the bottom page. Uh, we have English and Portuguese. The main language is Portuguese, but you can listen uh, to the interpretation in English uh, in the bottom page. And uh, uh, without any ado, I would like to pass it on to our moderator, Mr. Alexandre, uh, and his wonderful team uh, to uh, perform the uh, presentations for us today. Uh, uh, Dr. Alexandre, the floor is yours. Muito obrigado, Mr. Kazem. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazem, Professor Jafari. As it's been said, we do have two channels available, the Portuguese channel and the English channel. So our Brazilian audience or Portuguese audience might, who might be here might listen in English as well if they wish. Kazem and Jafar, thank you so much for the invitation made to us 10 months ago, right? This is the Scott webinar number 50. And 10 months ago, we had been invited and with this agenda. So I can imagine that Professor Jafar and Kazem might have even more episodes that are scheduled for the next year as well. So I would like to initially thank to this wonderful team and, one, and thank Lorena Farias who has worked with us in uh, NAMTOR 79 2020 and in 2021, and she's doing the interpretation. And I would also like to ask all of our colleagues, Yona, Veronica, Professor Mariana Coelho, Luiz Trigo, Guilherme Loma, for these opportunities to be here with us discussing about the theme of tourism and thank all of our audience, especially our students, our colleagues from Brazil and our colleagues that are beyond Brazil. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night time for whoever is listening. And I would like to say that the proposal for discussion about this article, which comes from the mind, the restless mind of Professor Guilherme Lohmann, who started talking with some colleagues and initially in the year 2021, he invited a very large group with 21 authors, and we published this article in the first version in Tourism Review. And this was a remarkable article in English. And then we soon had the invitation from the editors of the Brazilian Journal of Research in Tourism for this article to be updated and published in Portuguese as well. Hence, the article was published, we have this chart here, and we spread the word about this article about the future of tourism in Brazil through a critical analysis between the year 2000 and 2019. So this is our discussion that I would like to mention, as Jafar mentioned, the theme of COVID-19 that was so important for the worldwide population and all of the activities. And this is why it's one of the fastest growing activities. But we did have another factor in Brazil, which was somehow this government that did not recognize initially the severity of COVID-19 when it came in the year 2020, which aggravated the situation in our country as a country's where people have proportionally died the most from the disease, over 700,000 people. So all of these themes to make interpreting and comprehending tourism in our country somewhat delicate. And I won't extend myself our ideas to start the presentation 
and each one will have seven to eight minutes, starting with Professor Veronica, then Professor Luis Trigo, Professor Yonama, Yona Coelho, and Professor Guilherme Lohmann will be ending this reflection. When we'll have a four to five minute break and we'll soon open for discussion after our break with questions from our audience. Professor Veronica, welcome. Thank you so much. Your initial considerations about our article in the original tourism in Brazil. Thank you so much. I'm thankful to Professor Jaffa, Kazem, and the entire team who is organizing the Scout Seminar. I'm also thanking Professor Alexandre Panos, our colleague, for the invitation. And I greet our colleagues, I greet students, professors, and people hearing us from all over the world. I'm going to do a quick presentation by establishing certain, let's say, important information about the Brazilian economy and about tourism and how tourism is inserted in this economy. So I'm going to talk specifically about economy and distribution of income by tourism in Brazil. For the international audience, it's worth mentioning that Brazil is a country that has large proportions, like enormous proportions. The fifth position in the world rankings of territorial extension, we do have an immense territory and quite diversified. It's the seventh position now in 2023 in terms of estimated population over 216 million Brazilians around the territory and is the ninth largest economy of the planet in 2019. Even though this is right, we have a per capita income that's really low and in 2019 we were the 62nd place in terms of nominal income per capita in the world. So it's such a large country, but dealing with such difficulties as well, so many inequalities. In terms of our territory and our culture, we have a quite complex culture that's very rich. We have diversified cultural influences and these design and bring this cultural greatness through historical patrimony, which is important for Brazil. And we do have a potential to attract different tourism segments, developing several services related to tourism. But the main territorial and economic inequalities, they bring several challenges that need to be overcome in terms of social inequality. Historically, the country has always been marked by profound inequalities, territorial, economical, and social. It's the ninth more unequal country in the world in 2019, and the Brazilian economy is focused mainly for the domestic market. Somehow, the Brazilian economy is quite closed in international terms. And we have, in terms of tourism, traveling and tourism representing around 8% of the Brazilian GDP, which is quite a disputed and discussed figure. We do have some experts in tourism economy who say that this is not over 3% even. In Brazil, the number of national tourists is more than 30 times larger than the one of foreign tourists. And with COVID-19, domestic tourism became even stronger. And this was somehow favorable to recover destinations and especially small enterprises in the sector. Now in 2022, we have received only three, six, 6.3 tourists due to the impacts of the pandemic. But before that, between 2014 and 2019, we were around 6 million tourists for the entire country, which is too little and still insufficient. In terms of challenges, we have a very strong challenge in producing tourist information. 
which is quite precarious in Brazil and makes it difficult to monitor the performance in the sector and decision making both for public and private agents. Our business environment is very complex. The legislation is complex. There are many economic and legal uncertainties, excessive bureaucracy, a vast and complicated tax system, and a certain difficulty in opening small businesses. There is lack of incentive for the small enterprises. Besides many services in Brazil, they do not have quality for exportation. So our reception of international tourists is damaged by that as well. Maybe the most important thing which should be dealt with by my colleagues is the lack of continuity in treating public policies for tourism. More than problems, we do have success cases. Brazil has a regionalization process of tourism with a vast impact on the internal market. We do have consolidated destinations with very professional services such as Gramado in the very south of Brazil, the grape and wine region with the vineyard tourism, and you have Bonito with ecotourism. So we have this large involvement from the population and municipal councils in some cases, which have brought plenty of success to Brazil. We are now looking at new programs by the Ministry of Tourism that are looking at developing rural tourism, nautical tourism for the small entrepreneurs and small or indigenous communities tourism. That is a program that the Brazilian government is now advancing, and this is all looking at promoting sustainable development by valuing culture and mainly bringing better income distribution through tourism. I think I stayed on time, as established Professor Alessandri. Thank you, Professor Veronica. I would just like to let our colleagues know, those who are participating, that you can ask questions and after the break, you can send them to us. Thank you, Veronica. I did call my attention to the theme you mentioned as a difficulty, which is the theme of discontinuity of public policies for tourism. Now we're going to listen to Professor Luis Trigo. So he can tell us a little bit about the perspective of our article and the experience he has. What are the factors, Professor, that make tourism difficult or its national development? Thank you. Good evening, good morning to everyone watching us. There are almost 80 people now connected. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Professor Zafari. Thank you very much, Professor Panoso. And a special greeting to our colleagues. In the year 1990, I wrote a short article when in Sao Paulo there was this Congress, the International Tourism Congress. And I wrote some criticism about the tourism in the city of Rio de Janeiro in the year 1990. Looking at this text now, it seems that I wrote it last week. I mean, we have not evolved in certain points. And the main one, Professor Veronica Meyer has just reported, which is an economical aspect. The social disparity there is in Latin America, not only Brazil, and Brazil is contextualized in Latin America as a continent where these inequalities are so large and they've been extensively mentioned by all sociologists, economists, historians, political scientists, and etc. Remember the open veins of Latin America, classified by Eduardo Galeano. He is a Uruguayan 
author. He establishes this large difference series between the exploitation colonies or the Latin American countries and the populational colonies of European population, mainly colonization in North America and some Caribbean countries, although many countries in Latin and Central America have also been a problem with colonization for exploitation. As Professor Veronica said, this corruption as an issue and corruption is kind of like capillary in Latin America, but not equal to the capillary for every country. Even in Brazil, not all regions have the same level of corruption. And this corruption is clearly connected to criminality. So we have the issue with violence. I also like to recommend these books, such as this one by Bruno Paes Manso. This is a fundamental text, The Republic of Militia, from the death squads in the 1970s to the Bolsonaro and post-Bolsonaro era, where organized crime and its factions and militias, they are joining a phenomenon which only exists similarly in Mexico and parts of Latin America, which is narco trafficking and organized crime with religion. In Brazil, there is a name, narco evangelism, where many evangelical churches are using not all of them because I'm not generalizing all evangelical churches and not even historical Protestant churches even, okay? I'm just saying that some evangelical churches, especially in Rio de Janeiro, they have this very deep bond either with organized crime or militia. And militias now in organized crime, they mean different things as militias Historically, they were made by former police officers, firemen, public or officials on the state and municipal levels who went to the peripheries to try to establish order. But this just went to crime, crime and this is now considered narco traffic. So all of these structural issues, they make it difficult to develop tourism although there are some dangerous places such as South Africa that do have their tourism generating fruits. But when we join economic and social instabilities with political instability, then we have a very severe scenario, which makes it difficult to have these touristic flows, such as in the case of Brazil, which coincided with the pandemic plus an authoritarian government that damaged the image of Brazil abroad as the Bolsonaro government. It was terrible for the image of Brazil. And last week we went to São Luís do Maranhão in the Neptune Congress, which is an association of researchers. In Brazil, they're producing in other languages. They have contacts with internationally. And Eduardo Zanovic has shown so clearly, and others who were there, Jacqueline Gil and many other professors, commented on the damage these past four to five years were caused to the structure of tourism in Brazil, such as for culture, education, international relations, the agricultural aspect, environmental preservation, tourism was disorganized on purpose. And of course, this affects everyone. Although we are getting back to place, especially as Professor Veronica mentioned, especially domestic tourism, but the world is now looking at Brazil differently with the current government. The problems that exist, some things Lula are saying that are controversial and can be criticized, such as receiving Maduro from Venezuela. He was very criticized by the democratic forces of Brazil. However, the gains are immense and the external policy of the Brazilian government is infinitely larger than the <laughs> external policy of government Bolsonaro. We can compare with Fernando Henrique Cardoso 1 and 2 and government Lula 1 and 2. 
who had an excellent international articulation after 2003. Brazil started entering several crises that resulted in this regime. But these are all explained in different papers. But I'm going to talk about a book I wrote with Professor Panoso 20 years ago in 2003 called Reflections Upon a New Tourism, where we mentioned all of these economical, social, and political aspects. So there is quite an awareness by academia and entrepreneurs. However, a country with such dimensions, it has difficulty implementing those new ideas and avoiding old practices. You should remember how Brazil had 350 years of slavery. The enslaved ones coming from Africa, they stayed for 350 years in a situation that was terrible and degrading in Brazil. Brazil was the last country in the world to end slavery, black slavery. And this affected so much our society. As we have this social debt, which is immense with Africans and with our indigenous peoples, who in government Bolsonaro were systematically decimated. So it's impossible for academia and entrepreneurs from Brazil not to have this social awareness. It's not related to parties, it's related to principles, civilization principles. Regardless of if it's right or left wing, no decent party can agree with those barbarities. And you know why I'm saying this? Because the country is living through this polarity, as well as the USA and England. And this is something we'll have to solve. I stick to the seven minutes. I'm available for questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Trigo. You're always so much on time with your explanations. I would like to once again say that we have 80 participants, such a good audience. And those who are coming, you can listen to us in Portuguese, but we do have a separate channel where Lorena Farias is doing the translation into English. So Professor Guilherme Loma, Please let me know for us to speak a little slower in Portuguese so Lorena can translate as best as possible, which I'm sure is not a problem right now. Okay, now our friend Iona da Silva da Alonso to make her comments and considerations about the things she deems important, especially talking about gastronomy tourism for events, businesses, and hotels in Brazil. Please, Yona. Thank you, Professor Alexandre Panoso. I would like to greet all of our colleagues, especially Professor Jafar Jafari. And uh, Professor Panoso, it's such an important moment to share reflections between ourselves in this article produced by 19 Brazilian researchers. As Professor Alexandre admits, we have three aspects here to argue, so I would like to ask permission to represent the 19 researchers in this presentation. First, it's about gastronomy in Brazil. We all know how Brazil has this broad diversity in gastronomic terms due to its geographical aspects as well as the multi-ethnical population. But for this diversity to be converted into a competitive differential, we need to overcome certain nationwide challenges, such as difficulty in developing regional tourism products, governance and partnerships, both public and partner that are not deficient in the national territory, the lack of visibility for gastronomic attractions and strategies to promote tourism, and the lack of attention from the official tourism bodies about the different elements of the social system that is so elementary in our country. There are other regional challenges, though, and are very equally important, such as the limitations we have in moving food around because of the state 
laws and logistics issues that have to do with the federal organization and municipal organizations. And this makes it difficult for our chefs and the final consumers to know what comes specifically genuinely for it, from each Brazilian region. So we have the national forum that is always affecting so many gastronomic enterprises and so many activities that are so characteristic of tourism. We have the activity that has more mortality in the business, according to the rating on our restaurants here in Brazil. Although the universities are still focusing on the principles based on international cuisine, disregarding the Brazilian specialty. So the undergraduate and postgraduate courses should be focusing on training the workforce for the Brazilian cuisine. But when we're looking at the gastronomic context of Brazil, we're looking at the geographical indications that I mentioned due to the diversity and broad knowledge on cooking food from every region in Brazil. If we imagine the cultural diversity we have in this country, looking at its dimension and the potential of the so-called EGs in all of the national territory, I think she means schools of cuisine. So we do have potential to attract all kinds of tourist profiles, especially cuisine lovers those who love eating in the public markets and local food, and there are those who like to go to the nightlife in bars and pubs. So all of these experiences are now strengthened in Brazil precisely for the inclusion of Brazilian cities in the network of Brazilian creative cities when it comes to cuisine practices. So this is an aspect for reflection. And second, I'd like to bring now a mention of the business, tourism, and also the events sector for tourism. Due to the pandemic context where this segment for business and tourism sector was so much affected, not only in Brazil, but in the whole world, but the Brazilian reality of the growth of the tourism and business event sector. This is a specific thing due to the policies for the sector because we do have such participation from the private initiative, especially the conventions and businesses bureaus that are present in many tourism destinations in Brazil. So the Ministry of Tourism back in 2003 created the division in the segment because Imbratu started dedicating its efforts to promote the destination of Brazil as an international scope, especially supporting those convention bureaus. So this process of capturing international events and promoting the national events would be more intensified. So that policy adopted back then reflected so positively on the Brazilian tourism segments which was growing in the captation of events that lasted more than a decade, looking at the entrance of tourists and also affecting the income of the country. But there was a paralyzation of this program as the government changed, as well as the situation, especially in the pandemic we went through this changed the landscape in our country. Although the diagnosis of internal hegemonics for certain destinations we find in Brazil, for this segment, the destinations, for them to be effectively competitive in capturing events, requires investments and these go beyond attractions in the destination itself. It's required to have infrastructure that's proper for the demand with uh, an availability of convention centers, high quality hotels that are according to the profile of these tourists, because we do know that the profile of the business and event tourists is different than the ones that go for leisure 
We need good restaurants. We need companies that are according to the profile or the need to adequate those events besides uh, qualified workforce and betting in attraction of congresses, conventions and events as an instrument for forming a better public opinion internationally with regards to Brazil. That's the main challenge ahead, especially after such a traumatic pandemic period, as well as a halting of governmental actions in promoting Brazil as a destination. But we do have good perspectives with the current government, and we do expect positive results in this context for the business and events tourism sector. And finally, I'd like to share with you some impressions we have about hotels and the sector of hotels in Brazil. Well, with the exception of the pandemic that affected directly the hotel sector, it's important to notice how the evolution of performance indicators for the hotel tourism is following the Brazilian GDP. It's also interesting to note how the sector is oscillating according to the Brazilian economic development. Until a while ago, some intermediate intermediates, intermediaries such as travel agents, they need all those strategies to promote certain areas as hotel attractions. But we do see a significant change in the profiles now. Now the travelers they have facilitated access to different means of staying due to all these different internet tools we have and this definitely impacted the traditional hospitality sector as they traditionally worked especially with the platforms such as airbnb i'm sure we've had some experiences every one of us here with airbnb and we do repeat the destination right so that's the main implementation of those new tools, which will somehow empower consumers in choosing their tourism experience and how they want to stay. And this empowerment is not only for the decision in terms of hospitality sector, but the destination they find as a result. So these new technologies in the hotel environments and automation in general now requires less and less. Well, services are more automated. You are more independent really than hotels themselves. So there has been a great engine for the revolutionary changes in the sector. So we also have this perception that no traveler is going to an experience that needs to be in a hotel without doing a thorough search on social medias or the web when it comes to his stay there. So the very guest now is really playing this part of being the critical reference when it comes to that experience. And that's a whole new world we're living, not only for the hospitality sector, but many other experiences that are being lived. And we should share this immense knowledge in the vastness of the web. So I hope with these reflections, as I can contribute to the discussions of today, and I'll pass the floor to my colleagues right but also for you to add whatever is necessary and once again i would like to thank you for being allowed to having me here in this wonderful meeting for debates and reflections when it comes to past present and future of brazilian tourism thank you thank you so much professor my friend and colleague yona for your timely reflections and we have received so much information on our WhatsApp, our friend Sergio Leal, our colleague from Abtu, from Abratu, our colleague in the paper is informing us we might, we have over 120 people participating in this event right now. That's such an important audience for us. Professor Mariana Coelho, please 
your considerations about our article and your perspective and vision of tourism in Brazil. I reiterate that we should speak a little slower for Orena to be able to do better quality translation. Good evening, such a pleasure to be here with you, following you with all of our colleagues that are so competent, that are quite a reference in tourism, especially in Brazil and internationally. As Professor Luis Trigo said, we have other activities, other published papers, and they also help us understand. Just for you to have an idea, what's the idea of the article that Guy is going to explain? We wanted to know what was the future of tourism in Brazil. Is there a future? This should be a first question. Is there a future in tourism for Brazil? So for you to have a perspective or as an example of how we worked on this paper, I'm going to show you some aspects involved with parks, national areas, and also cruises. And also I wanted to talk about my field, which is marketing. Just for you to have an idea, we have an ecosystem which is so diverse Professor Yona also mentioned the cultural diversity, gastronomic diversity. Veronica said we have plenty of economic and social diversities, and we also have biological diversity. So in the conservation units, which are some of these natural areas, we wrote on our paper that in 2017 alone, we had 10.7 million visitors. I mean, that's above the number of visitors for international tourism, tourists in the whole country, which reinforces the idea that we have domestic tourism, which is so strong. So in conservation units in Brazil alone, we have more visitors than foreign tourists. Another situation when it comes to cruises is that Brazil has such an extensive coastline and with that we have since the year 1998 the opportunity for the international cruise ships to come down here to Brazil but for this to happen 30 percent of the crew should be Brazilian right so there are initiatives initiatives such as uh, conservation units the cruises, but this is not enough for us to have high quality tourism for international events and especially attracting other visitors, especially foreign tourists, because we're very much based on domestic tourism so far, especially for conservation units, as I said. Even there is a collection from the fees they have from the visitors who pay a fee, that money is not enough for maintenance. Same thing for the cruise ships. Those people, they are going to face eventually other local problems such as dirt, dirty streets, corruption, things like infrastructure that's poor, there's no logistics, they can't get to know that city properly. and why am I saying all this? Because in my perspective, the problem of tourism in Brazil is a problem with management. And it's a problem with management on every level, both on political terms, as Veronica and Trigo mentioned, also when it comes to the entrepreneurs themselves, like some who just couldn't really move through the pandemic softly. It was so difficult. But it's not only in the pandemic that these entrepreneurs have difficulties. Sometimes these business owners, they have small businesses. They don't have any training or capacity building. So we do have a very important role in this sense 
as professors of important universities in Brazil, and we've played our part in generating this training they need, but it's not enough. It's not enough because I have Professor Beth Valda, who is always saying about hospitality, as Professor Jafari also says, is like tourism must be good for Brazilians. We are a country, we need to improve so much for Brazilians when it comes to issues such as violence, healthcare, education, and access to housing. We should improve for the employees, the workers of the tourism sector, because we are an area that we are really ungrateful, you know, when we work every weekend, no conventional hours, and making relatively little when compared to other jobs. We also have gender issues, which is worth mentioning in our field. We have less women in management positions, and also the sexual tourism, which is worth mentioning and we should fight against this type of action that exists so beyond the workers beyond brazilians we should always think about tourists and for that we need to understand better the behavior these tourists have or how they are living these experiences for us to be able to improve there are initiatives, there are good ones, there are changes happening. Professor Jafari said in the beginning about the lessons learned. Professor Veronica and I wrote a paper about this. It's published now. It's about the lessons learned through tourism during the pandemic. And we learned so much about management, so many aspects we mentioned, process management, technology, facilities, capacities, how to interact with clients, but we still have a long way to improve. And in our paper, we mentioned how some of the situations can improve. And I like to talk specifically about the digital marketing, which we need to work with, but we need a budget for it so we can bring tourists from abroad and some of these strategies should be looking at digital marketing in social media because it already exists, but it should be a deeper dialogue focusing on the Brazilian reality and spreading for those abroad. Uh, Brazil is not only about Rio or the Amazon. We really need to select better our tourism products and destinations that are already on an international level and they prove the promotion of these destinations and going beyond all of the public policies and aspects we are seeing and I invite you to go have a look at our article. Thank you so much. I'm available. Thank you, Professor Mariana Coelho for your reflection and it calls the attention how this theme of very little management in Brazilian tourism, right? I do remember we always hear how much planning we have and how little management we have. And in reality, this theme also involves political instabilities. I do know Guilherme could explain, maybe Trigo could also comment after the questions, but it's important for us to mention how this week, right now, today, we have a discussion in the national media going on, whether the current tourism minister, uh, she, if she should continue as a minister or if she should take the leave and another politician, a man, will be appointed by President Lula. So many are criticizing this perspective. As the government does not value tourism indeed as an activity that has so much potential, so much attractiveness, and so much possibility for social change. Guilherme, please, 
What do you think about all of this? What do you want to point out to close with the reflection session? Welcome. Thank you, Alexandre. Good morning for those who are in Australia or in Japan, such as Kazem. Good evening for those of you who are in Brazil, those who are in the Americas. Good afternoon. And I would like to thank you for the invitation. And I wanted to be the last one to talk, as the last one is always the easiest. I must say that everyone's already said everything I wanted to say, so I have nothing else to add. So what I'm going to do is try to abstain myself a little bit and not talk about Brazil. Can I ask all of us to create a story? A story is like a 70-year-old grandma. She's turning 70. She lives in one of the biggest tourism markets in the world. We could understand it as the USA or Europe or China or Asia. Asia is the future of the world. There is no doubt. So let's imagine how this grandmother, she's going to take her married daughter and her grandchildren in a total of eight passengers. They're going to all travel to celebrate the lady's birthday. So they need to decide the tourist destination they want to go. So they look at the map and they're like, let's go to a destination that is like nine hours away. We should all go into an airplane to get to this destination. But we all need to require request a visa to find this destination. This will cost us money, time, and bureaucracy. Besides, we're going to this destination that very little is said in the national language. Let's suppose it's English. And also this destination creates in me several social barriers, such as security issues, also social inequality. So I think you already know where I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is that in reality, there are so many things that were said by all of the colleagues here and our article shows it. And those who study tourism also know how difficult it is to point out a single thing. The easiest is for us to position ourselves in each other's roles and us as Brazilians, we have such difficulty doing that. We always position ourselves on our own side due to various reasons, because we're nice, because we're polite, because we're cool, because our country is beautiful. As Veronica said, our geography is exuberant. Yona mentioned our incredible cuisine and so on. So we can exchange this lady and this trip with a family of eight and have an event with 500 people. The problem would be the same. Okay, so what's the most Thing, the biggest thing we can use to compare, Guilherme, is there are so many problems. There is a comparison that you could make, such as in the case of Australia. I could, just to give you another idea, that in the year 2019, Australia received a little over 9 million international tourists. Australia has no neighbor to do international road trips, such as Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. There is no land neighbors that you can just cross the border by car and contribute to the large parts of the international visitors. We have like six or seven million. So that's not it. Besides, 
Australia is 10 hours away from the United States by plane. China is the same, nine hours away from Japan, seven hours away from Singapore, and 15 hours away from Europe, much worse. On the other side, Australia speaks English. That's a competitive advantage, as we know, and there is no excuse for us not to train and educate our population to learn English. China, 20 years ago, we had 250 million Chinese people learning English. That's about the country. It's not only about being an honor to speak English. Yes, let's learn to speak English. But well, let's learn English. That's an international language of trade and tourism in the whole world. Let's once and for all end this false Catholic or Christian hypocrisy there is in Brazil, as I just came back from the Philippines. Actually, I went there countless times. It is a disgrace to be called the Catholic country. In the case of the Philippines, it's worse. There is no retirement pension. There is no public health services. No one who calls themselves a Catholic can perpetuate this position of the wealthy elites who are not looking for a concrete change in our country. Concrete change, because we won't be able to grow individually as we don't solve the collective problems we have. Several other aspects, such as martyrism, was mentioned, right? Going to land in Singapore is the easiest thing. You don't even see anyone. Everything is electronic. Filling the form, this was done electronically. There is no paper nor pen. Organization of events. As in Australia, they organize events. They are incredible. All the policies are followed. All the planning is followed. I could talk about airport concessions and so on. But what I wanted to summarize this at is that we need to move out of our own selves and understand the tourist and what makes the tourist go anywhere so we can have a serious understanding of our country and see what's missing and what we should be doing as a country or nation for us to be proud of being Brazilians and for people to be proud of coming to visit. So that's all from me, Alexandre. I'm also available. And I would also like to thank you who are colleagues, friends and incredible partners to accept this madness it was to write an article with 19 people in the English version and 22 in the Brazilian version. Thank you for betting this madness. Thank you so much, Guilherme, for your reflections. You are also bringing us a point that we start to ponder about. It's a new perspective. I'm just saying that we have more than 120 people present here with us watching and participating. We have programmed a four minute break now and Kazem is going to play a short video. And during this time, you can send your questions either in English or in Portuguese, and you can just put them on the chat because we'll be collecting them. Okay, so now a four minute break and Kazem and Professor Jafar said, and we'll be back there will be a video and we'll be back for the question. So don't go, stay with us. I'm sure the next 30 minutes will allow us to go deeper in this reflection. And I just wanted to say, Professor Jafar, Kazem, that I can see people watching us. They are participating. These are people of the highest level, of the highest quality both students and professionals who are interested in tourism in our country. We already know such a large group of professionals. So thank you once again for the opportunity for us to discuss a theme that is so interesting and so dear to us. Thank you. Kazim Jafar. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for the uh, wonderful panel and the first hand information from your country uh, that I haven't been uh, and I would like to visit. 
Um, we have uh, a number of people on YouTube, over 40, and I want to invite them if they have any question, they can send their uh, question on YouTube uh, chat and we will collect it and uh, reflect it here in, in Zoom. Um, so I would like to ask uh, our Scott admin to show the video, please. Thank you. A gente sabe é digno de qualquer roteiro de viagem. Tem belezas naturais, gastronomia única, festas típicas, mas nada disso parece suficiente para atrair turistas estrangeiros. A maior parte do fluxo de turistas, 93% segundo um relatório do governo federal, é de locais mesmo. Na comparação com países asiáticos, europeus e até latino-americanos, o Brasil tem números que não refletem o próprio potencial. Eu perguntei a especialistas do setor. O que explica isso? Eu imagino que pode estar passando pela sua cabeça. É por causa da falta de segurança, criminalidade, violência. Em parte, tem a ver com esses velhos dilemas, sim. Mas pensa comigo, tudo isso tem em vários lugares da América Latina, inclusive no México, que recebe nove vezes mais turistas do exterior que o Brasil. Ou seja, não é por aí, pelo menos não só. A resposta da pergunta envolve outros aspectos. Por isso, antes de tirar qualquer conclusão rápida, vamos falar um pouquinho de números para a gente ter primeiro uma ideia da dimensão do problema brasileiro? Vamos lá, o Brasil estagnou na última década em pouco mais de 6 milhões de turistas estrangeiros anualmente. Os dados são da Organização Mundial de Turismo. Pode parecer muita gente, mas algumas comparações bem simples mostram que não é bem assim. Só a cidade japonesa de Osaka, por exemplo, recebeu mais turistas em 2019 que o Brasil inteiro naquele mesmo ano. Nações como África do Sul, Austrália, China e Tailândia também costumam atrair mais estrangeiros que nós. E estão praticamente tão longe quanto o Brasil, dos Estados Unidos e da Europa, de onde mais saem os turistas. Na América Latina, o México, como eu falei, é um campeão do turismo. Cerca de 45 milhões de pessoas visitam o país a cada ano. Claro que nesse caso tem a proximidade com os Estados Unidos, as infraestruturas de resorts, monumentos históricos, rotas de cruzeiros. Por isso, fazer comparações assim é sempre difícil e abre margem para relativizar um aspecto ou outro. Afinal, todo o país tem seu contexto. Independentemente disso, é um fato que o Brasil, tão bonito e diverso, está atrás, não figura nem entre os 40 países para onde os estrangeiros mais viajam. E olha que a gente nem falou em pandemia ainda. Os dados até agora foram referentes a um período anterior. Em 2020, quando a crise de saúde começou, em 2021, o Brasil amargou um saldo ainda pior. Só que essa queda brusca aconteceu no mundo inteiro, então a gente precisa focar mais nas referências de antes. E algumas são, aliás, muito importantes para essa nossa discussão. Se não está tão fresco na sua memória, eu vou lembrar você de duas oportunidades de ouro que o Brasil teve para conquistar turistas estrangeiros entre 2010 e 2019. Copa do Mundo e Jogos Olímpicos. Não deu muito certo. Esse número de pouco mais de 6 milhões de visitantes estrangeiros que eu citei variou bem pouco por causa dos eventos, nada tão expressivo. Em 2014 e 2016, os anos da Copa e dos Jogos Olímpicos, respectivamente, o Brasil recebeu tantos turistas estrangeiros quanto em 2019, e especialistas afirmam que as cifras deveriam ou poderiam ter dado um salto. Olha o que o Guilherme Ditzer, assessor econômico e membro do Conselho de Turismo da Fé Comércio de São Paulo, me disse a respeito disso. Pensou-se muito no evento em si, na Copa do Mundo, nas Olimpíadas, e não se pensou num produto Brasil para se perpetuar aí para a economia mundial, para mostrar para o mundo que o Brasil é muito além do futebol e da natureza, a praia, tem gastronomia, cultura e assim por diante. Faltou um pensamento conjunto das autoridades, além desses eventos. Mas não dá para colocar tudo na conta da falta de articulação durante a Copa e os Jogos Olímpicos, não. Eu vou explicar por quê. Na avaliação dos especialistas com quem eu conversei, alguns entraves são estruturais. A imagem que muitos estrangeiros têm do Brasil é historicamente ruim, por vários motivos. O Brasil às vezes entra no noticiário internacional, por exemplo, com manchetes negativas. Um misto de casos de corrupção, violência e desastres ambientais, como o de Brumadinho. Tem até ministérios de relações exteriores que dão conselhos aos viajantes que querem ir para o Brasil. O da Alemanha cita que o risco de se tornar vítima de um assalto ou outro crime violento é significativamente maior no Brasil 
do que nos países da Europa Ocidental. E alerta, a cautela é apropriada mesmo em partes do país e de cidades consideradas seguras. A gente pode acrescentar um outro fator, o custo total da viagem. Não é nada barato para quem sai da Europa, muito menos para os próprios vizinhos latino-americanos. Mas esse fator é tão decisivo assim? Pesa mais que os outros? Quem avaliou foi o professor e pesquisador da USP, Marcelo Vilela. É claro que o preço é um fator importante, muitas vezes é um fator determinante para a escolha do, do local que o turista vai visitar. Mas considerando que essas moedas elas são mais valorizadas, né? o euro sobretudo, é, quando a gente fala assim de modo mais geral, né? no caso do turista europeu, mas enfim, outras moedas de outros países da Europa, dos Estados Unidos, eu não penso que a questão do preço seja um, um fator, é, seja o principal fator. O professor lembrou de um outro ponto-chave, o marketing. É como se o Brasil tivesse dificuldade em promover no exterior os seus próprios trunfos turísticos. Eu vou dar um exemplo. Em dois... Thank you, cousin. Thanks, Alexander. Um, I think uh, you uh, are going to chair the panel discussion. And uh, uh, me and Jafar, uh, and we have also Professor Malcolm Cooper, our rapporteur here today, uh, would like to uh, uh, ask some questions sometime when you allow us. Um, the floor is yours. Claro que sim. Uh, muito obrigado. Yes, I hope we can. Thank you so much, Kazem. So before all of your questions, we received here some questions from the audience. And I would like to say that Professor Iona, she's the one who's going to answer the first question, OK, by Sergio Junqueira, who works with events in Brazil. And Sergio saying, Iona, how we have more than 50 conventions bureaus in Brazil, and only a dozen of them are present in the ICA ranking. So does it mean that most of them are not looking for the uh, capturing of international events? How do you see this? Thank you, Professor. Sergio so good to receive you, to have you here with us and requesting me to answer. And I do start with the idea that we have so many conventions bureau in Brazil and conventions bureau somehow would be organized regionally and have a regionalized action that is stronger, such as in the state of Santa Catarina, where we have a significant number of convention bureaus that eventually dispute events that could be in a regionalized condition and being more competitive within the state itself. But trying to answer your question, my perspective, as we look at these reflections and these discussions we follow, what we see is that for you to capture international events, you need the resources for it. And these are not often in the structure of the conventions. Because how do the conventions survive? based on the contribution of associates. And who are those? Associates are local entrepreneurs, often the small to medium entrepreneurs. And we often have the presence of the large entrepreneurs as well, the owners of convention centers and so many convention centers. We are still in the reality of giving a private economy mainly in the country. So this requires more support in the process of capturing international events. And this role was performed by Embratu. Embratu had all these calls for so many years that they opened to give financial support for the convention bureaus for them to capture international congresses and the policy was lost for a few years and hopefully now the actions will be regained so we can become more competitive and therefore bringing more international events for the country it's a little bit of the direction we follow alexandre i'm available for any other addition or questions thank you so much Anna. Alexandre, can I make a comment, Yona? I think it's worth us mentioning 
how some convention bureaus exist to create a structure for governance where there is a stiffening of the governmental structure precisely and this leads well it's not mentioned it leads to an opportunity for corruption which is incredible there are private interests in somehow attracting those resources that are public due to the stiffening of the power like the government in all its instances. We know of countless cases of corruption with the use of public resources in the conventions bureaus and in other ways as well as Trigo mentioned the corruption, but there are many articulations of this type and these are due to a lack of structure of governance, which is clear. So we'll have this incredible need to create governmental bodies and entities which are capable of managing public power, money as if it's an entity that is semi-public or even private. So this creates separations in cases where the Convention Bureau instead of helping the municipal or state department, they will create a competition with divides uh, trade. We have this division of efforts in the trade. That's all I wanted to say. Well reminded, Professor Guilherme, this somehow wears out the work of those structures working more seriously as the conventions bureaus are created by civil society organizations that are non-profit, which is a little outside of this purpose, and it's actually blemishing the integrity of the people who work in those places. I'd like to add that, on the other hand, where public actions are not happening to promote the tourism in that destination, and I'm talking about visitors, uh, leisure, where municipalities or the administrations don't count on the conventions bureaus. So sometimes they have to do this extra work, which creates a division in the efforts that are escaping the main purpose of the conventions bureaus, which are capturing events for destinations like these. Thank you. Yona Guilherme, please interrupt me whenever you want. I just wanted to say that we are pointing towards problems and difficulties. And we have a question here that I received in the order by the PhD student of the University of Sao Paulo, Laís Oliveira. It's a question for Professor Veronica. Professor, what are the specific strategies that we could implement in Brazil to improve public and private governance in the sector to impulse the development of regional tourist products and strengthen the tourism bodies? Yes, I think this is about what perspectives we're looking at. Can you comment upon it? Okay, very good, though it's a difficult question, which involves all these efforts as so many. This is a fundamental aspect in tourism where efforts are joined. So individual strategies, they don't work so well and maybe they won't work for a while. But I think we need to answer to some questions then maybe my colleagues could comment upon other questions. One of the issues is that we cannot treat Brazil as something that as a whole, you know, it's not precisely a, a whole set as we have such territorial diversity, cultural diversity, and I often see how public policies and the strategies developed by tourism destinations, they're still so related to the 
so-called mass tourism. So they're looking at tourists as a whole, and many times the attempts are a little disorganized when it comes to attracting tourists in general. So it seems uh, that these strategies should be studied according to the destinations and according to what makes sense for these destinations, what makes sense in terms of historical and cultural roots, and connecting this, as Guilherme said so well, connecting this to the process of decision-making from tourism, tourists, like different interests, different experiences. It could be cuisine, it could be experiences related to sports or maybe ecotourism. So we have this large diversity, but I still feel that both public powers as well as a private initiative is looking at tourism as a mass that's formless and not looking at these people as in marketing, we know, right, Mariana, my dear colleague who does the marketing, we are not looking at people like this for a while now. And there are very successful destinations that when we do an analysis of the strategies of very successful destinations, we can see how it's a vision that involves different segments, audiences and interests. And sometimes it seems pointless from our side, but it might make sense for some more specific groups. And this should be very profitable, especially when we're thinking about local communities and businesses, as Yona mentioned. We are trying to generate profitability and sustainability for these businesses financially and also thinking about the environmental impacts because as we have so large masses of tourists, we're actually deteriorating and reducing even prices. So we should look at this very, very carefully. And certainly we need to have good managers, as Mariana said, it's fundamental. We need better management. We need better managers. We shouldn't be afraid of management in the Brazilian territory, but public and private anyway. I didn't answer completely, but that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. In reality, to answer to this, question, we wouldn't have to write an entire thesis, it's so broad, diverse, and profound, but it's important for us to bring reflection. As once again, I'd like to ask Professor Mariana and then Luis Trigo uh, similar question, and then Kazim and Professor Jaffa. Professor Mariana Quil. we have a question that follows your line of studies. How do you assess the gap between resources and attractions in Brazil from the perspective of forming the image of a brand? The platformization of the sector, do you think it's an opportunity or a factor that generates a loss in competitivity in Brazil? Roque Pinto from West asked the question from the lovely Ilhos. Good evening, Hawking. Just a very nice question, talking about things that are so pertinent when we're talking about tourism and image. I usually say how there is an important aspect there, an image which is more personal, and it's passive of change, which is a positive point. And an interesting point for us to change our image is through knowledge. Let's say you have an image of Africa and you somehow have the opportunity to actually travel to South Africa, you would have a completely different image through the experience, which is so interesting. And there is another situation. There is a set of images that I see that in theoretical terms is even more attractive which is the idea of a reputation. 
Brazil has this poor reputation. This set of images that are assembled through time that as when we compare to other destinations, we do have as different aspects of competitivity involved. So when we're talking about the gap, I mean, what is the gap between these attractions? I particularly don't think that are things that are attractive in Brazil, though I think there are many places, but we are missing a good management and good financial resources, especially to improve and improve, make this image better. So this will really make it necessary to have more investments. There are some, but they are insufficient, especially on the international level. This might work on the regional or domestic levels, but internationally, not yet. The platformization, the platformization of the sector, I understand this as even a point of the marketplace with the countless platforms we can know more about tourism in several destinations. Particularly, Mariana, my opinion is that this is more positive and a uh, possibility to gain more visibility. So I can tell what are the possible experiences we have in, from Ouro Preto to, to Curitiba, where I am right now, or giving visibility and opportunities to change images. But on its own, it's insufficient to change the scenario we now have. So I don't know if we can answer to competitivity. Let me just end by saying that this will depend on countless factors. So for us to be competitive, mainly uh, looking one at the other, as Professor Guilherme Lomo mentioned, all these points that are so important for us to become competitive as one of them, which is indeed empathy and getting to know and study a little more of our consumers or tourists that are real in potential. Thank you so much, Professor Mariana, Professor Jafar Gazin. I promise that's the final comment we're going to now make to Professor Trigo and then you too. We do have a long comment here by Josiane Brito de Almeida. She's a master's student at the Federal University of Fluminense, and she's not really asking a question, but considering that we have many other challenges and problems in developing national tourism, and these involve mobility, transportation, racism, queer phobia, accessibility, inclusion. And yes, Josiane, we agree with your comment. As it's not a question, I'll just register. So now the final question I have is a first question for Professor Luis Trigo, and that's specific for the field of training. Eusario is asking Professor Trigo, as our colleague Eusario is in the Netherlands. He was the president of EB2, and Eusario is always the kind of person who battles for the tourism experts. And his question is, could Brazil be a protagonist? If we valued the tourism professionals in the public management and in private enterprises, is it work to disseminate the terminology of the title of a professional called tourismologist or a student of tourismology or tourism sciences or whatever? Another question for you, Trigo. It's the theme of training in the field is from Graziele Velo. How do you perceive the teaching of tourism in Brazil facing the complex perspectives we have in the field? Do we have enough professionals to work in a way that is competent in Brazilian tourism? Thank you for your question. My colleague and friend, Osario. Look, Osario, this is not Anyway, the world, not in Portugal, nor in Spain, these are tourism professionals. The name won't change. The name is irrelevant. What will change is the posture. 
a posture from professionals. What are you talking about governance? We don't have any governance. And it's not adequate in many ones. And this is from the tourism sectors in general, in the fields of parks, both the public and private parks, and the water parks. Hopi, Hari is a park, uh, like an amusement park, that is always about to go bankrupt. There are some exceptions, such as Beto Carreiro in the south, an amusement park that has a good administration. But the problem is not in the nomenclature, but in the structure. And when it comes to professional training, it is the same problem for any other one. It's a poor basic level education. The military governments have taken the chance to implement very bad basic studies for children, and these are actually in ch the municipalities are in charge. And then when you have higher education, the federal institutions are prevalent. And when you have the middle school and high school, this is the state that administers. So the problem is that this municipal and state level education has been horrible for decades. And for higher education, we have all these difficulties, such as prejudice with regards to tourism, leisure, entertainment. You have professors of higher education who are against the market, pure and simply against the market, which is so archaic and improductive, counterproductive. If there is criticism about the market, this cannot be pure and simply against the market. It's actually childish. It's a belief that's childish. And we have this prejudice that has to do with mass tourism and so on due to the elite being involved, and we also have the leftist prejudice when it comes to leisure, tourism, and so on. These are all prejudices we should, by evaluating and making this into concepts and having more critical understanding that is not pure and simply against the market, or defending ideologies that are obsolete, either left or right because these are totalitarian. And we should not forget how tourism is born. It grows and develops in democratic regimes that are pluralist. And if we're trying to tackle sexism, like structural sexism, LGBT phobia, or racism, we should strengthen the knowledge, professional training, humanistic formation and democratic practices that are pluralistic and inclusive. Thank you so much, Professor Luis Trigo. Thank you, everyone who asked your questions, Professor Jaffa, Kazim. We have more than 120 people watching us right now, watching us in this reflection. I'll pass the floor to Kazim and Professor Jaffa for your comments and questions if necessary. Thank you, Alexander. Um, it's a very diversified conversation and the diversity I think is uh, one of the, the uh, best description or characteristic of your country. Uh, what I'm in particular uh, interest of Brazil is uh, the diversity of food culture and the biodiversity um, that I hear. I'm a specialist in, in agri-tourism and agriculture heritage that I uh, believe that your country is a, is a um, ancient uh, food civilization and uh, the food culture that you have can, can talk uh, without uh, the borders of language to the world. I think uh, Brazilian food culture and biodiversity can even overcome uh, the discussions of, of what you mentioned about the leadership and management. And uh, 
such a rich uh, biodiversity and um, and destination potentials, uh, it will uh, or it is uh, generating uh, uh, huge potential for uh, and capacity for involvement and inclusion. And this nature of inclusion also can bring a new era of management. If people with all level can find their own level of engagement and benefit from the tourism industry, uh, this uh, will uh, create a platform uh, for empowerment. And uh, people can find their share uh, and benefit from tourism and they can grow. And in this situation, uh, the uh, empowerment process is much more. But I don't think there is a lot of competition uh, with uh, the existence of uh, such a, a rich uh, biodiversity in your country. Um, I would like to pass it on to Professor Jafar uh, because of the time limit and uh, um, see uh, how Jafar is going to uh, wrap it up. Jafar, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Kazim. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Uh, a very exciting uh, uh, topic uh, by, uh, uh, as delivered by an excellent uh, panel. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned some new lessons and reconfirmation of some old lessons that we knew. I just pick on, a, on two or three items uh, with my comment. One, uh, right at the beginning of, of the, uh, uh, in this panel discussion, we learned about the importance of domestic tourism um, to, uh, that really can save the tourism of Brazil during the COVID-19. Uh, domestic tourism is extremely important in every country, well, not island countries that are so small, but the large countries like Brazil, like United States, like China, or even middle-sized countries like uh, France and Germany, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, the tourism industry is always, and the government always concentrate on the international tourism only. Uh, open any book and you see that they say the share of this country or that country is so much is always in relation to international tourism. So I hope uh, uh, one of the lessons that we have learned from uh, uh, the pandemic is that uh, we should give more attention uh, to domestic tourism, which has more values and easier to manage because there is no gap of culture between the host and guest. There is no gap of language. Uh, there is a, a higher multiplier effect uh, uh, or, or the no leakage, let's put it that way. So I hope we will, we will wake up to the, uh, to, the, to the tune of the importance of domestic tourism um, uh, in uh, globally. Uh, I think if we really think about the big picture of tourism, uh, more than 90% of it international is domestic tourism is, uh, and only 10%. Some people say 5% is international tourism. But uh, all the statistics, statistics we see about the importance of tourism is that 5% or 10%. So I hope we go back to uh, giving more importance to tourism. Uh, the issue of hospitality, gastronomy, et cetera, was also mentioned. And I'm one of the subscribers to this idea uh, hospitality is a uh, character of a country at the same time. So uh, whether we express it through food, music, dance, whatever it might be. And hospitality needs to be emphasized more and more. And uh, fortunately, for, uh, for not fortunately, just, just in general, uh, smaller communities like rural community that C Cousin was talking about and some of you talked about are in a better position to uh, offer authentic um, authenticity representing tribes and ethnic groups uh, of the nation and so on and so forth. So we have to pay more attention to uh, accentuating hospitality, but what 
what distinguishes Brazil or any country would be the hospitality, the color, the flavor of that country. The issue of gender was raised. Uh, uh, well, uh, yes, that is uh, uh, gender uh, in the area of uh, 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 tourism. Um, for, fortunately, according to WTO, 54% uh, of the total workforce in tourism is women. So it's already moving in that direction. And uh, thanks to our, the architect of this panel, um, Alexandre, uh, we have a perfect balance. We are, we, the panel is six person, three uh, female and three male. So the balance is right there in the industry, uh, uh, in, the, in the workforce and on this pan panel. Uh, and actually, uh, I don't know about your universities, but in most universities, the balance of male and female students in hospitality and tourism is changing in favor of female uh, students. So the future of uh, hospitality and tourism will be uh, female dominated for sure. And this is coming. Uh, the issue, and of course, the image that we will we, we'll talk about, image, uh, image, uh, the hospitality would uh, add to the image of the country. But in with the uh, in the case of image, we and especially in the case of Latin America, we need to uh, mention safety and security, which becomes part of the image, and uh, the countries that cannot offer. Um, safety and security, no matter how strong the other colors are, it may not work. Uh, uh, education and training, that's, that would be the last point I would like to make, is extremely important. Many of us here are professors, students of hospitality and tourism, so we know the value of hospitality and training. I hope we, we, we place more emphasis uh, uh, on uh, uh, education and training, particularly training uh, versus education, vocational schools and the like, because majority of tourism employees, hospitality employees have vocational uh, uh, strength. But uh, for us, the professors at, uh, of hospitality and tourism, we have to put the lessons of tomorrow in our lectures of today. How much uh, do we uh, teach about climate change? In, in our curriculum, very little, extremely little. Isn't climate change a, a major issue coming up? And which industry is going to be the first victim of climate change? It's going to be hospitality and tourism. So do we teach that? Uh, do we concentrate on that? Um, so I just wanted to make that point as well. And I want to thank the panel for the wonderful discussion. We learned a lot about the situation in, in Brazil. Uh, the tourism industry of Brazil. And in a way, uh, we learned about uh, the, the displeasure with the public administration of tourism in, in Brazil, government or public administration. Uh, this is an extremely important uh, um, um, uh, government, is a, a, a very important stakeholder in tourism. Uh, but uh, come back to ourselves in the hospitality and education. How much do we teach about public administration in tourism? We don't really teach that much of public administration. So how do we expect the, the people working in, in ministries of tourism or government tourism offices or public uh, to have the right education for the right job? So I hope uh, we put climate change, public administration, and hospitality back in the core of hospitality and tourism education. And back to you, Kasim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jafar. As uh, expected, and as usual. Obrigado, professor uh, Jafar. Muito obrigado, uh, Kasim, pelas considerações de vocês. Thank you very much, professor Jafar and Kasim, for your considerations. And I would like to say that one of the main themes for us in the country is for us to work as a network working with the colleagues who are now interested in the proper development of national tourism of our macro region of Latin America as well, and having as a focus, as an objective, the human development, the development of the person. If we don't put this as our goal, Professor Jafar, we won't be able to reach 
anywhere. We must work within this perspective where the entire theme of training our destination, education, professional training, marketing nationally or domestic and internationally. All of this should focus on this concept that's philosophical, which is eudaimonia, which is the human thriving, the human realization within the possibilities. If we don't do it, we'll just be not doing our part in this world. So I think that these colleagues who are here today, all of our audience, all of the reflections, all of the important questions asked. And this dialogue should help us reaching this human thriving and also thinking about the others. Tourism should be a vector for development of our society in all of its aspects, more democratically inclusive, ethnic, honest and moral. So I think that's it. And I would like to thank once again, Professor Jaffa Kazem for organizing this webinar number 50. Number 50, and I had the great pleasure to participate in another one. And we're talking about a theme of tourism in Latin America. I would like to thank Professor Yona, Professor Veronica, and Mariana Coelho for the participation, for writing the article together with us, Professor Luis Trigo, Professor Guilherme for your participation, and also say that we have colleagues from all of these networks here, but we have four main networks in Brazil, and we should work together. The Brazilian Association of uh, BAs in Tourism, Abratu, our group, the Network of the Tourism Observatories and APITU, which is the National Association of Research and Post-Graduation in Tourism. Professor Jafari Kazem, you are invited. Professor Jafar to return to our country. Professor Jafar and Kazem, who's never been, I invite you to come here visit. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Alexandre. And thank you very much for the wonderful panel and the engagement. I can see still people are joining us both on YouTube and uh, here in Zoom. Uh, and I just uh, sent the uh, LinkedIn page of the webinar on, on LinkedIn uh, in the chat. So please leave your comments and, and questions. We will uh, try to connect uh, you with the uh, speakers and uh, moderators. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh, I believe that uh, uh, you as a team and what you mentioned all is, is uh, the, the power of education and human resource management uh, for tourism development. Uh, at the end, I just uh, would like to share the uh, uh, heritage of Scott with everybody uh, in a few, uh, maybe seconds, less than one minute video.
Thank you very much. And at the end, I would like to ask uh, all participants to uh, open their videos. Uh, please uh, open your video cameras and we will have a, a group uh, memorial photo of a scar. Wow, wonderful smiles. Uh, there are several pages because the number of uh, participants are more than to be in one page. So I'm going to take several photos. If everybody is ready uh, for a big smile, three, two, and one and the second photo three two one and i see here professor malcolm cooper our reporter also here malcolm thank you for waking up that early and uh, we will uh, wait for your comments on the LinkedIn page due to the time uh, constraint. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, obrigado, gente. Um abraço. Tchau, tchau. Tchau. Tudo de bom. Um abraço. Muito obrigado. Bye. Bye. Tchau. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ótima semana a todos. Thank you very much. Tchau. Tudo de bom. Thank See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, folks. Muchas Thank gracias. you. Thank you. Obrigado. Que bonito. Bom dia. Que bonito foi. Put